Hello and welcome to the Sovereign Collective Podcast, where we bring you real raw truth for your self-empowerment. I'm your host, Sasha Calaboda, and I believe that you can stand on your own two feet, but that you don't have to do it alone. I love learning from people who continually strive to raise the bar, to go against mainstream thinking, and who dare to question the general consensus. People are risking ridiculed or even risk the loss of their professional status as they bravely question the common narratives and challenge the rest of us to expand our minds and to reconsider what we think we already know. Join me in learning how to take control of your health and your mind so that you can have the energy to think more clearly and the confidence to step up and take responsibility for all aspects of your life. We promise to never censor here because I believe you are strong enough to hear the real raw truth to make up your own mind. If you like what you find here at the Sovereign Collective Podcast, then please share with your friends and family. I so appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. And now, on to the show. Hello, everyone. It's Sasha here for another interview for the Sovereign Collective Podcast. And I am with Tanya Verquin again. And we are going to get deeper into the information of German New Medicine. Super exciting. So, if you don't know about it, you never heard about it before, you stop this interview now, you go back to number 64, and you listen to that one where Tanya intros it beautifully. We talk about how it was born, what it's based on, the five biological laws, which inform the whole body of German new medicine. Uh, we go into some examples of how it's you can use it in your life and, and what how it's explained. And it's just it's just a fascinating, fascinating journey down the path of owning your health. And understanding and removing the fear around symptoms and why things are seemingly going wrong when they're actually not going wrong. So it's a really super fascinating, interesting subject. And I've had a ton of great feedback around that interview. So I really look forward to continuing that conversation. So thank you, Tanya, for being here today. Yay, I'm excited. Thanks Yay. for having me back on, Sasha. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, well, you can see how to contact Tanya. It'll be all in the notes. We'll talk about it at the end as well. She's also a very accomplished artist. So you'll want to see her artistry as mm -hmm. well. So we'll talk about that at the end. But for now, we're going to get into a different aspect. Of German, well, not a different aspect. Of German. We're going to get into a topic. So there's a couple things that are unique with German New Medicine and it's how they look at the handedness of people and how we look at symptoms when they're on specific side of the body and what that means and how that can inform us a little bit more. We're also going to talk about the bugs, those bugs that are waiting to get us, right? That are contagious, maybe not, that are, you know, that they're scary. We need to be worried about, we need to protect ourselves from. Is that really the case? So we're going to get into that as well. But first, I have promised a lovely lady that I'm going to ask Tanya a question about why she would have been born with a cyst on her brain stem. So she didn't even get out into this world yet. And she already had a cyst on her brain stem that has affected her for her entire life. So Tanya, why would somebody born be born that way? Yeah, that's really interesting. And I've, I've never really come across anyone or known anyone to, to be born with a quote unquote cyst on, on part of their brain. Now with the brain stem, so like, I'm not sure if my answer is totally correct, but what I'm, I'm answering it from the perspective of the biological laws of nature. And so the brainstem, let's just focus on the, this beautiful part of the brain, this brain relay, and anything that is controlled from this brain relay always is associated with um, a very specific tissue group, which is the, which is the endodermal tissue group, right? And this means that there are very specific types of conflicts related to this. This is the oldest part of the brain, the oldest uh, tissue group, endodermal tissue group. And so it's related and associated to our basic needs, anything associated with our basic needs. So we're talking our breathing, being able to eat, like nourishment and procreation. So this is the part of the brain that controls this and our, all, this, all conflicts are associated with these basic needs, okay? So if for me, just thinking about it, okay, first of all, if it's an assist, um, is it really, because a, a lot of times when um, we have diagnosis of assist or some sort of um, abnormality within the brain, it's actually a hammer foci. It's a hammer focus. This is what Dr. Hammer was able to scientifically prove on over 60,000 
uh, cranial CT scans that this was this was his scientific foundation of this framework was that the impact he called it a hammer focus that was just what he called it but this it's this impact at a very very predetermined area in the brain and if it was in the brain stem then we know that um, it has to do with one of these biological conflicts associated with our ability to survive so this could be like morsel conflicts like um, not being able to get a take in a morsel. A morsel can be anything, whether it's food, whether it's an air morsel or a sight morsel or a, a breathing, you know, air morsel. It could be like um, a starvation conflict. You know, we're not getting the food, the nutrients we need. It could be related to um, abandonment or existence, the, my existence that's, as at stake or refugee. Um, so these type of conflicts or, or a gender or appropriation. Now for, for, you know, in utero, they're not, it wouldn't be a gender conflict. It wouldn't be appropriation conflict, um, but it definitely could be related to an existence conflict because as a fetus, we, there's still a soul. There's still a psyche there that is perceiving sound, noise, vibrations, energy. And so if something's going on with mom, um, that can definitely be passed in utero, right? It can be felt um, energetically. And of course, that energy taken in and perceived at the level of the psyche can begin that biological response. And so my question is, I wonder if the, the cyst wasn't actually um, a hammer focus that would just prove that this, the, the infant um, perceived a conflict in utero, which is so, so common. And then, you know, you're born with certain, certain ailments already, and this is why. And so, you know, this is, that's where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm more on the lines of, was it, is it a cyst? It, what they quote unquote, um, you know, um, identify as a cyst, right? Like does, are what they saying is a cyst or is it just a hammer focus? And it, depending on what it looked like, because they would have had some sort of, visual representation of it right in order to to say oh this is a cyst on the brain stem so you could see from that picture that imagery if it was dark it would it would definitely be in it and you had the target ring formation this would be the hammer foci and if it was light colored and and really like bigger and puffed up this would be it in the healing phase so there's what is a beautiful brain edema over the area as to protect it because healing always happens in a fluid environment. So, you know, at, it depends on what stage they would have classified it or, you know, looked at it and then um, said, okay, this is what it is. But I'm thinking when, she, when in utero, she would have experienced one of these, you know, basic needs conflicts. And, and it was either in the healing phase or she was conflict active, it, active with it when she was born. So, you know, it would be interesting to talk to her mom if that was possible and to kind of connect the dots, like what was going on? Or if she could even answer that, what was going on? Um, do you know what your mom was doing when she was pregnant with you? And um, yeah, like what was her life like? What was her environment like? Was there anything that, um, you know, could have could have been, you know, picked up as a conflict shock? Yeah. And, and like I said, this is very, very common. So she's been quite debilitated by her entire life and she's, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how old she is, but she's moving on in, into her age. So I'm just wondering, you know, does that mean it's just never been resolved and it's just always been there? It's been hanging the entire time because she's had, you know, the symptoms as a result of it that's affected her motor skills and her just everything really for her entire life. Well, being on the brainstem, that wouldn't affect the motor skill. So we know that there's something else involved. There's got to be the other part of the brain relay, you know, that affects the motor skills, which is the cerebellum. So that's a totally different brain well, relay. Okay, I'm saying motor skills, but maybe not motor skills, but balance sometimes, energy. Um, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm not explaining it right, but, and I don't know, maybe there is something, but as far as I know, it's only cyst on the brainstem. So, right. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking there's a constellation involved. So it's more, that means there's more than one conflict in, in the right and the left. So we've got, you know, we have two hemispheres, we've got the right hemisphere and the left. And when you have two um, active conflicts or one 
even just one in each side, this produces the different um, frequencies, right? The brain hemispheres oscillate at different resonance. And so it produces different behavior issues. And this is where, um, you know, these type of issues come in, not issues, but behaviorals right. um, come in and they start affecting us that way. So there's, there's more than just the brainstem involved, it sounds like. Right. And, and so I think initially yeah. it, it was, it was a conflict that had to do with, you know, this basic needs in utero and then possibly, you know, there, there's more maybe on the way out, maybe during delivery, there was, there was other trauma she experienced. So, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And so say, for example, say it were you and you had a baby and this baby was born with what was diagnosed as a brain cyst, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I would definitely, I would want to get a brain CT scan. I, I would want to figure out, is this a hammer focus? Let's find out because then we know what we're dealing with. And, and if it is like, we, we know that conflicts are resolvable. So we, we would want to keep that infant, that baby feeling as safe, as safe as possible. So I'd never, never leave that baby. Like babies need to be, have that contact. So this would be my first thing is I wouldn't leave the baby side. It, it's right. connected to me. Yeah. You have that. It's got to feel safe. And then we'd find out what are we, is this really a, a hammer focus? Right. So right. we would, yeah, we'd want to talk to a GNM practitioner who actually is trained to read CT scans because the CT scan, if it's a, if it's a hammer focus, it's going to show you in a very, very precise location of the brainstem. I'll just get a diagram out here of the brainstem so people can actually see. So this yellow bit here, this is looking down, okay, on the brain, on the brainstem. Um, there's a whole bunch of different specific relays in that brain brainstem, that, that area that controls all these different uh, organs and tissue groups. So depending on where that hammer focuses or that quote unquote cyst, we'll tell you if it's up here, then we know, oh, this has to do with the, um, uh, sorry, the, the kidney collecting tubules. So this would have been an abandonment conflict or existment, existence, her, the life was at stake. Maybe the mom literally something happened where she, she suffered an existence conflict and that energy got passed on and perceived um, in, in utero. So depending on where that CT scan, where the location is, it will definitely right. tell you exactly what type of conflict it is. Right. So that's that's what we have to do. I mean, that's why having CT scans, access to them are so important because it, then there's no questions. There's no guessing. There's no there's no trying to figure things out. We, right. we actually have an answer. Right. Unfortunately, right. getting a CT scan done in North America, you got to run through hoops. It's it's like ridiculous. So this is something we need to really get. Um, You're going to get one here, right? Yeah, we, yeah. we definitely want to get get the access for sure. Right. Yeah. Make it accessible to everybody because it's so, so important. But then we'd have to have the right person reading it, right? Like I, yeah. I my understanding, it's very few people that can really fully understand how to read them. Yeah. Dr. Hammer didn't train. I think he... I think he trained like one person how to read a CT scan that might have been no and I don't even know if because um, Helmut Pilhar was the only appointed lecturer that Dr. Hammer himself appointed to teach this science and even in his lectures I heard him say he was never really taught how to read CT scans properly wow. so um, it's it's definitely doable people can learn this but you have to be coming from the GNM perspective right because right. it's a completely different paradigm. You're looking at different things. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So well, I, I, I hope that was helpful. I just, I honestly, I just coming from the biological point of view, that's what I have to say, but I, I really don't know as far as, um, you know, that that's my answer. That's yeah. what I would offer. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So before we get into the interesting stuff around the bugs and everything, I really want to talk about the handedness and the left side, right side, because it's interesting because it depends on not necessarily your handedness, right? But on your, I don't even know how they refer to it. But what's interesting for me is from a, coming from the spiritual perspective and other more esoteric teachings, your right side's always your male side, your left side's always your female side. 
But from a German medicine perspective, it's the mother side, the dad father side, right? It's not always like that. So, and then sometimes it doesn't come into play and sometimes it does. So, so can you explain to us that whole area about Germany medicine? Yeah, yeah, it's called really the principle of laterality. So it really describes whether the person, a conflict affects one on the right side or the left side and who it's associated with. And so we have to remember these are biological laws. So Dr. Hammer wasn't, he, he spirituality wasn't in this context right so I know with yeah. the esoteric teachings and stuff like he wasn't studying that aspect at all he was studying what happens in nature what happens to the animals in nature and and how how does it correspond to us and it it's always the same even for animals their right side it depends on their biological handedness so we can always figure out our biological handedness and I'll show you how in a second but, but after I'll explain it first so I'm right-handed I'm biologically right-handed and um, that means that any conflict that is to do with a partner. So a partner is anyone other than your mother or child. So it could be my spouse. It could be a friend, a cousin, a grandparent, an uncle, a, a father. colleague, a father. Okay. Yes. So anyone literally other than a mother or child, it's going to affect me on the right side. And the left side is always my mother or child side mother and or child, right? It could be all three. Um, so that, and then it's it's the opposite for left-handers. So left-handers, their partner side is their left side. So, and then their right side is the mother and child. And this, the only time this doesn't apply is for any brainstem conflict. So anything that is controlled from endodermal tissue. So what we were just talking about with the brainstem, the basic needs, this doesn't apply. This is always ingoing morsels. Ingoing is the right and outgoing is the left. So for example, if I have a, an earache in my right ear, right, this is going to be not, it's, I'm not saying, okay, I'm right-handed. So this would be partner related. No, this is, we know it's a brainstem related conflict. And so it's a morsel, it's a hearing morsel. So what couldn't I cut, what couldn't I bring in? What hearing morsel couldn't I hear? I was waiting to hear something and I didn't. So right is always ingoing. And if it's on the left side, it's oh. outgoing. So what couldn't what couldn't I get rid of? What morsel couldn't I get rid of? A sound morsel was I, you know, all of a sudden my neighbors pumped this music and it was dreadful. And I was trying to entertain my grandparents, like something that caught you off guard, but you couldn't get rid of it. So that's where laterality doesn't apply. So ears are always like that. It's always ear, right ears going in, left ears going. When you have the earache, yeah. that, you know, yeah. that, that basic Wait, earache. My son yeah. just went through something, which I was going to have questions about. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But other than the brainstem and endodermal tissues, all the other tissue groups, it's a laterality applies and is significant. So we have to consider now sometimes, okay. sorry, sorry to interrupt, but the, just no. so for endodermal, when people are say, hearing endodermal, that's more like your innards, like, like your vital organs and things like that. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. the yellow group. So if yeah. you, if you ever get the, the nice chart, it's yeah. always divided. Yeah, get them. Actually, they, they are in print again. They just, oh. they just started printing again. I can actually send you the link. Oh and, yes, please. Cause yeah. I looked and I couldn't get it, but I do have this lovely book that I was showing you. Look people, this is what my friend got me for my birthday. Yeah. So and his insane. pages, I believe are color coded too. So you'll yes, see the are. yellow. Yeah. Yeah. They are. Yeah. At the back. Yeah. And so it's a really good visual. It's like right yes. away. If you see yellow, you're like, okay, I don't have to consider my handedness, but I do need to consider, you know, except uh -huh. like for intestinal stuff, you know, indigestible morsels. You're that's, you're not going to be like, oh, what was I trying to in intake and outtake? No, you know, we're looking at it. It's still laterally do doesn't, uh, isn't relevant in that group, but you're not thinking outgoing and ingoing. You're you're thinking, okay, well, what was the nuance of the indigestible morsel? Okay. So now to figure out your biological handedness, because it doesn't mean necessarily like if you write with your right hand and you you're more dominant, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're you're biologically right-handed. I think I think it's 60 or 65 percent of people are right handed and and the 40 percent is lefters. They're lefters. Mm -hmm. um, you the clap test is what Dr. Hammer always recommended. So the hand that's most dominantly on top or moving the most is your biological hand. 
So um, yeah, it's always good. It just, if you sit with your hands on your lap and obviously just go to clap, just notice which hand's more on top. Some people say, well, I clap like this. A both few hands. people do. I've asked them lately. I'm like, well, let, let me see you clap. And they're like this. I'm like, really? <laughs> I think it's the one that moves more, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you need someone to look at this or even like just um, stand behind someone and just, you know, push them forward a little bit, mm. letting them know you're going to, and which, which foot do they step forward with? Right. That'll help them know. And that's what you can do for your animals too, or your pets is you look, what's their dominant. So if, if they're sitting, if a dog, for example, is sitting in and you're saying, okay, stay. And then you're calling them for a treat, which is the paw he steps forward. That's going to let you know his dominant, his biological side. Okay. Yeah. So laterality is significant because, you know, if we have a rash, like for example, Sasha, my dad, my daughter had a rash on her left arm on the inside of the crease, her elbow crease. And so it, it was just there specifically. It wasn't anywhere else in her body. And so you have to ask, we know that, you know, the outer skin, this is laterality applies here. And so we're talking separation. This is this is what comes up for this type of rash and, and why the arm. So she doesn't have um, children. So obviously I know that it's correlated to me. Ah. So what is that separation conflict? But she had just moved and she moved to the city. This was last summer. And then she came back for the first time for a visit and she woke up with the rash. So this was the healing phase of her separation. Wow. And I didn't realize that, you know, this, but it just, but there's no hiding. It's, it's just amazing. Like you can't hide anything anymore. It's, it's pretty cool, but that's where it's helpful to know your laterality because then you're not guessing it's for sure. Um, mother related, she's right-handed and it was on her left arm. Yeah. So interesting. Hey, so, so what if somebody has eczema all over their entire body? Yeah, that's a good question. So this is what we call a, a generalized conflict. So eczema, if, if you've got it everywhere, both sides, this is like you're in a couple different programs. They're both separation programs, but in different phases. But this is generalized. So there is something massive that it's just so much. You're, you're not liking the environment. You want out of the entire environment, whether that's mm -hmm. home life or it could be both. It could be home life, work life, but it's just you're not having it. And you're, you know, your your psyche has perceived separation. Um, on some level. So eczema is one of those things that do often affect a lot of, especially both sides of the body. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you have to, you know, really now begin to go on to the self inquiry of what is it that you want to be separated from or um, who, or who is it that you have been separated and you cannot, you're no longer able to be around them. So it's, eczema is two two different programs in different phases so oh. think of like for example if someone um doesn't want to they had a really nasty boss and just cannot stand to be around that boss had a bad experience so when they're at work they're going to be in conflict active phase so the rash won't appear won't uh, won't appear red red or anything it's actually going to be itchy and it's going to be flaky their skin but when they get home they are no longer around that boss. And so they move into a healing phase, which becomes inflamed, red, sore, hot. And then imagine that that same person at home has a separation conflict, maybe with the mother-in-law, right? Maybe the mother-in-law lives in the house and it was unexpected and now they just can't stand her presence. So now at home, they're active with not the boss program now, but with the mother-in-law program. And then when that person goes to work, she, they're not around the mother-in-law, so they're in healing phase. And this is the on-off, and you've got the white, you've got the red inflamed skin over top the white flaky, flaky dry skin. Wow. This is what these programs are. That's this, yeah. So there's a lot of self-inquiry needed at that point because, you know, what is going on? Like, what what's the environment like? And so that's interesting. So I would think, say you had a conflict and it calms down because you're in the active stage. What I can see people thinking when they get home or whatever, and it starts to heal and gets worse, whatever it may be, they, they're they going to think that's bad normally because you don't understand what the healing phase actually is. So right. I can see them associating the problem with where it comes up, where it gets yeah. worse, not where it's being 
muted a bit because it gets more, it was more back in the active. So the symptoms stop. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yes, I can see how we're going to associate that and make the wrong association. Yes. Which yeah. happens lots. Yeah. Right. That's such a good point. This okay. is why it, like the, the mindset shift, the more that you, you learn the, the quicker this mindset happens, like the switch in mindset happens and everything, the world looks different. Every, you know, the world does look different after this. It's, oh, it really does. Absolutely. Totally. And so if, if somebody viewed their mother-in-law as a mother figure, would it be a mother conflict? If it's, if it you know, it's not her actual mother? That is, that's completely subjective. We, we wouldn't know. We can't predict that. It, it's a subjective perception at the level of the subconscious. So if that person perceives them literally on the subconscious as a mother, then right. it will affect their their left side if they're right-handed and vice versa. Right. But if it, no, it's just, you know, it's just this lady, this woman, right. okay. then it would be a partner, partner right. side. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, folks. So when you go to clap, don't overthink it. See which way you go. Like I definitely go right over left for sure. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but everybody's different. It's funny. And, so, and then try to make the correlations next time something comes up on one side of your body prove it oh, to yeah. yourself like find the conflict make the association and then it's just another like it's a win for the subconscious because every time you prove this these biological laws to yourself they just get bigger like more and more ingrained um and this just becomes the way you think after that right right this i think in this book here he talks about an example where it could be a localized conflict say somebody got slapped on the face and they just got slapped on one side and then something happens there. And yeah, it's if it's a literal, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So if it's a literal blow to the face right. and that, that became a conflict too in and of itself, right. then that's literally where the hand hit. So that yeah. could be like an attack and then comes, there comes the, the, the rash on the level of the corium skin. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. 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 Yeah, it gets deep. It's, it's, it's confusing, though. You got to know there like there's so many things. And sometimes it's I don't know, it's it's a lifetime of study, I'm sure. Oh, right? it is. Really? It, and there's yeah. there's things that we there's things that we're always going to be learning. And I don't I don't know, like, what if Dr. Hammer, there's more out there that, you know, he didn't he didn't figure out like there could be. It is. It's, you're right, Sasha. It's such a lifetime. It there's is. so much involvement, especially when you get into like the constellations, like we were talking about before. So constellations, just when there's multiple conflicts, is that right? You don't have to get into that now, but just because sometimes it's not as clear. It's not like one thing. Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily, it's multiple, but it has to be in both, uh, in both sides of the hemisphere. So there's got to be conflicts going on in the left and conflicts going on in the right. And then this, this is what creates behavioral changes. This is what creates um, like somebody's personality there's pretty oh, much no okay. one on the planet that isn't constellated that doesn't have one okay. or two conflicts going on at the same time in both sides of the hemisphere most people dr hammer figured have about 10 conflicts hammer have about 10 hammer focus in the their brain at, uh, at any time at like in any yeah. stage in any stage or in the act like in what, like different stages in, in any stage yeah in any stage yeah because so, life is right like yeah we all we all yeah. have things unexpected right. things yeah right right so what so does that like so when you're talking about the behaviors is that going to be depression is that going to be yeah, yeah um, it explains depression yeah depression or psychosis yes psychosis yeah. precisely yeah yeah any sort of mood or even like um dementia and alzheimer's all of this is ah. is caused from constellations and it's all explainable and, and constellations like that behavior, like in order for someone to be chronically late, for example, this is to, this is actually caused from a constellation in the brainstem where you have double, both kidney collect and tubule programs running at the same time, one on the right side and one on the left, because there's two, right? And uh, chronically late, you said? Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, please continue. Okay. Yeah. But so that was just an example of, of you know, it's like, we always say, oh, they're so late and we get so frustrated, but they literally can't help it. They, the sense of time, they, they just don't have that ability to have this, this sense of time. And it is always going to be, um, you know, in degree of severity of how severe the conflict was or conflicts were. 
So, um, or, or just think of people who like collect collectors and hoarders and stuff. This is a constellation. This is a very specific type of constellation. They're not born that way. They actually, they develop this behavior as a protective mechanism, right? Just like we develop the symptoms as a protective mechanism. These are the biological programs. So everything's very meaningful as a way to help us cope with and survive the conflicts. So yeah, constellations are considered the higher mass basically of the this framework of the biological laws because at this point you got to take into consideration people's um, hormone status, their laterality, their gender, and and it all comes into play all at once. Um, yeah, it's it's quite intense and and something that again it'll be a life learning for me. Right. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, that sounds far more complicated. So we'll leave that at that. Okay, so let's move on to the bugs. Let's move on to one of the biggest fears of so many people these days is catching something, uh, and, uh, the, the, the idea of contagion or bacteria causing the problem or the so-called viruses, which I know Dr. Hammer never decided whether those were proven or not. I really feel they, they're just a really great way to put the fear of God into people and make them do what you want them to do. Um, and, and, and parasites, like all of the things, all these little critters that are living in and on our bodies. Let's yeah. talk about maybe the overall view of those and then go from there. Yeah, of course. It's such an important topic, Sasha. And it is you, you're right. We have this fear. It's just conditioned into us, but the microbes, including parasites, including even mosquitoes and ticks and lice, mm. all of these are nature's cleanup crew. They literally are the surgeons of nature um, and they are the fourth biological law of nature. So this is the ontogenetic system of microbes. And so this, this law actually, Dr. Hammer formulated in the mid 1980s. So it's been around for so long and yet we still have this crazy fear and misunderstanding about what these microbes are. So in each tissue group, you know, there's, there's the yellow tissue group, which is the endodermal and the orange tissue group, um, the, the mesodermal, and then we've got the newest, the red tissue group, which is the ectodermal. We have different types of microbes in each one of these tissue groups. And these microbes are in, around us and on us all the time. I think we have like three to four pounds of microbes in and on our bodies. That's the average. So, I mean, they're trillions trillions of microbes within and on and around us. And there isn't one area in nature that is without microbes. So we, we have to know if there's so many in this universe, in this, on this planet, in our bodies, in our own beautiful beings, we, we have to know there's significance to them. And so what Dr. Hammer discovered scientifically was that um, these were actually nature's cleanup crew. So they only, they only were called, they, we have them in us all the time, but they're only active when they are called to clean up tissue, to restore tissue. Right. So if they're not available in our bodies because over hygiene, for example, or from antibiotics, um, then we don't have those beautiful cleanup crew microbes to go to work and take away all those um, dead cells and all of those extra tissues that were built up during the time when we needed more tissues to help us cope, depending on which biological program is running. So they really are there to assist us. So if you have a tumor, for example, a tumor is developed in, let's say you got a lung tumor, right? This is a fear of death. Anything that's caused a lung tumor this is going to be a fear of death conflict. And so during the conflict active phase, the lung alveoli is, is creating way more tissues, way more cells to be able to absorb more oxygen. So you can literally breathe better. You can absorb more oxygen. Mm -hmm. But if someone and when someone, um, and keep in mind, during this conflict active phase, we've got the microbes. It's actually fungi in this or fungi. How, I never know how to pronounce fungi. I say fungi, I don't fungi. know, whatever, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so this fungi would be within this tissue group, okay? And it's there, but they're not active yet. When someone resolves their death of fright conflict, okay, they come into resolution, that tumor that was developed in the lung, whether it's the right or left or both, um, that has to be, be broken down. It can't stay there. 
right? Right. It, it could stay there. And there's a, there's sometimes it does. And we'll tell you, we'll get into that, but okay. it has to be broken down. Well, what is going to break that down? Of course, the fungi is going to go in and break that down. It's, it's going to be the surgeons. So they're going to come up and they got to take down, break down that, that tumor because all of those extra cells are not needed anymore. And all of those extra cells that were developed in that tumor are actually different than the normal lung tissue cells. So they look different. So the fungi or fungi knows exactly what tissues to take. Like it's just absolutely incredible. And right. they leave everything else, right? So all of that now has to come out. Well, how the, the only way it's gonna come out is through the mouth. So this is where you're coughing up. You're even coughing up, like if you had a long-term lung cancer for like a few months or something, or even a, a year, you're gonna be coughing up parts of that tumor. You're gonna be right. coughing up blood, probably a lot of phlegm. Um, it's gonna be painful. You're gonna have night sweats. You're gonna have fever. You're going to feel like horrible, right. but when we recognize this is actually what's happening and you've got the fungi, you're, if you're coughing it up, you're, you know, and, and the fear can be left alone. It can be left at the door because you understand what's going on. And now it's just a, a matter of treating you, like what therapy can you use to calm yourself down to, you know, to nourish your body while you're going through this, to get the rest you need. But regardless, we've got the tissue breaking down. If, for example, that you don't have the, the microbes, microbes in your body, um, as I said, due to over sanitization or whatever, then that tumor actually stays in place. It encapsulates. So it's no longer growing because the conflict is resolved. So there's no more tissue adaptation, but it actually, there's nothing there to break it down. So it just encapsulates and stays there, remains there. Now, someone who has an encapsulated tumor in the, the lung, they're going to have a lot harder time breathing as someone without that tumor. So we, we have to see the importance of needing that, those fungi in place in our microbes. So that's just an example of, of that type of program and the necessity of it. And so when you ask about parasites, well, these are not found naturally in our bodies, but they are still naturally everywhere in nature. Um, and they're actually found in meat and stuff. But if you, if you don't, if your environment isn't in a healing phase at all, they will not have any use in your body. And so you will, they will just go right through you. So a lot of times we might have parasites and not even know it. And we just, we say, oh, we just, wow, we just pass a bunch of, we, you can see them sometimes. If they're going out of your system, you know, you're not in a healing phase. They don't, they're, your, your body doesn't need them. So it's the same in nature, okay? If, if they're called because they're needed, they need extra, your body needs that extra support because maybe there's not enough microbes in your body, then they're used, they're done, they're, they're literally do the same thing as any micro, any bacteria would do. They, they clean up, they're taking out all the extra dead cells, they're, they're doing what they need to do to remove it from your body. And when it's done, then it's done. They, they leave your body naturally. So I know somebody who has been doing parasite cleansing probably over a year and she still keeps getting rid of parasites. Like she's gotten rid and like boatloads, well, but she's so doing it through killing them, right? So think of what a parasite cleanse does. What do you think it does to the microbes in her body? All of the microbes. Well, if there's no microbes in her body and she goes into a healing phase, the parasites need to be there because she has literally no other microbes in her body, right? To well, do she the is work. doing other, she does a lot of other, like, I don't know if she doesn't have anything. She does a lot. She's very health conscious and she's doing a lot of, you know, bringing in a lot of microbes through ferments oh, and good. living outside. She's, she's, she's milking her goats and she's oh, living wonderful. out. So she has a very natural life. It's just these parasites have been a thing for her for a long okay. time. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really yeah. interesting. It's, you know, we just, I wonder what, what it is, what, yeah, it would be interesting to see environmental, like, because you know, she's getting the, the microbes, she's having raw milk, which is amazing. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see why, why the parasites keep coming up for her. Yeah. 
that would be something that we'd, we'd need a conversation and just to kind of get into the nuance of, you know, and what's going on in the psyche, because that's really, if, if the psyche hasn't perceived a conflict and hasn't perceived a, a resolution to a conflict and wouldn't, wouldn't move into a healing phase, there would be no need for parasites. So, so what kind of conflict are you looking at for parasite specific stuff, or is there a big wide range? Well, it could be anything, anytime your body needs to be for the tissue. So you could, yeah. we're talking glandular tissues, tissue. So, or glandular like tissues and connective tissues. So anything muscular or, or bone related, uh, lymphatic, this is all, all any of these. It's it's a huge wide umbrella of different types of conflicts that can come into play. But being that they're there, she's finding parasites. We know that her body must be in healing phases often, right? So I wonder, you know, if she maybe she's hanging healing from a conflict or multiple conflicts, you know, they just kind of on and off and nothing's really resolved completely. And so there's no need for the parasites to to fully leave. Mm. so that that might be something that's going on so you know what are those unresolved conflicts that you know I I would that's kind of where I would I would start is is looking what's unresolved that it just kind of is still going on that that could be fully resolved right. and then um if the environment isn't um isn't conducive to to microbes and uh to parasites because you're not in the healing phase there's no point of them being there. The parasites will just leave. So what do you, what is your idea when people say that parasites are there to clean the house, like the heavy metals, somebody's got, you know, a heavy metal poisoning and they're there to, they eat those all up. Cause that's. I, I've never really considered that actually. Yeah. I, I don't know. As far as I know, it's, it's just the tissues, but um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't, I don't have an There's answer. More, and the more natural circles when people, the, the, the shift around looking at the parasites is changing than that they won't reside in a healthy body, but it's not coming from the biological perspective, like GNM It's coming more from, okay, you've got excess mercury, excess iron, you got, you know, parasites are there to help clean house kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's an in interesting, um, view on that and I don't know I would definitely need to need to right. do some reading up about that okay. okay but is is that saying that you said parasites can't survive in a healthy body well this is again this is a paradigm shift we have to start making because it, just because we have symptoms and you know maybe we've got diarrhea maybe the parasites are there does that mean we're unhealthy it, it means that we're literally in a healing phase our body's healing it's it's restoring itself so you know what is healing what is a healthy body? This is where we really have to begin looking at, you know, and considering the different points of view. Right. So does, does being healthy mean that you're, that you never get a conflict and that you never resolve your conflicts? Because if you're resolving them, you're going to have symptoms, you're but that it. means yeah. you, you're, you're resolving conflicts. That's a wonderful thing. Right. So parasites will be in that, in that body, if, if it's conducive and if you're, you know, exposed to the parasites. Right. 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 So do you do any cleansing or detoxing, anything like that? Is that part of your protocol at all or? No, I don't do nothing. any, I don't do any detox, anything like that. Um, I just naturally, I find myself in the spring. I wanting to try to kind of switch up my diet. So I just totally. intuitively change, you know, in the summer, I, it's just, you know, you, you naturally, your, your garden's growing the things that you feel yeah. that you want to eat. And so you get away from, the other types of things. So in winter, I don't typically eat a lot of greens like lettuces and stuff because they're not growing in my environment right now. And so I'll just leave that. But um, no, I don't really do, well, I don't do them at all. So no, I've never done any sort of cleanse in that way. Um, mm. Yeah, just because it's, for me, what am I trying to clean out? Like there's nothing for right. me to clean out. It's just a different uh, perspective, I right. think. Totally different perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cause, and that's me too. Like I'm a big fan of seasonal living, whether it be how much you're sleeping, what you're eating, that the activities, the way your thought processes are going, everything, it really, there's a rhythm when you tap into that rhythm, you just naturally will change things up as we get in flow with the seasons, which I really think is a mm -hmm. great way to be in tune with this circadian world right with the rhythms of the world I really feel it's just a natural way to live 
Yeah, it's and it's biological, it's a bio right? That's right. I was going to say that. <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah, no, if we right, align right. with that, that's right. Right, right, right. Okay, so this woman yesterday, had a day yesterday, and she comes in with this big thing on the side of her breast, and she just had this, we just sat there and bawled together. <laughs> she just had this huge release and I'm really because it she she just had this big realization and that she had to re release you know the death of her husband and children moving and all this stuff and it just she's like oh you opened it for you and she just had this huge release I'm thinking oh please 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 let the healing like let it now really get on its course so oh sometimes when you get into wow. people's stuff it can be so emotional <laughs> <laughs> but it's so great it when they can. own it that's what i love about this when when it clicks for them and they decide to own it right and then they get empowered to yeah. stop trying to follow the the remedy that they need to find to fix it knowing that it's an inside job yeah yeah, yeah. okay that's right yeah it's so fun so cool so okay so colds flus things like that so often a cold will start in the nose and then somebody's going to get a sore throat and then they're going to get a lung congestion problem you know and it's like it's traveling it's not like it's just one area sticks there you 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 resolve something and boom you're just all snotty for a little while and then you're done and it seems to like travel it's moving around all over the place and which i would think is controlled by different parts of the brain and so what's going on there mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great question. It's different, different conflicts. So if, if it's coming at the same time, these symptoms, that means they experienced multiple conflicts at the same time that were perceived in different ways. So for example, um, you can have, you were just saying, you can start kind of it in the nose and then you have like the sore throat and it's kind of happening all at once. Um, these are different tissues. So they can't be the same conflict. It's not right. the same conflict content. They're, they're, control from different brain relays, as you said. So that means that for the smell, that stink conflict, that's probably an annoyance. Most, most often in this day and age, it's an annoyance conflict. It's not a literal scent of danger, although it could be, right? So it could be a, a scent of danger or the this, this stinks, the situation sucks, or most, most commonly it's an annoyance. It's out of, out of the blue annoyance that you have to put up with now. And then the throat is just can't swallow the situation. Oh, I just can't, I can't swallow what just happened. Like I can't accept it. And that typically happens at the same time. Think of when you're annoyed at something and you just yeah. can't, you're like, no, I just can't right. even. That is, that's an example of perceiving the, the situation in two different ways. Right? right. And so it seems that these are traveling, these symptoms are all coming up and right. it's spreading and it's affecting, but it's because you're you subjectively in that moment perceive them in two different ways. And, and just think of sometimes people's eyes water too. So this mm -hmm. is a different, this is again, a different tissue group. This is a light, uh, this is a light separation, visual separation. So I don't want to see this. I do not want to oh. look at this. Right. Okay. And so, so imagine a situation that that's annoying that you can't accept and that you don't want to see that's very common. They happen together, right? Totally. And so there's the explanation of all of the symptoms, but um, they, they're they different. They're perceived just a little bit different. Um, it's the same conf same More situation, conflict. but it's yeah, really different. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. you have all these different responses to it. All exactly. Time. Yeah. And if the lungs are involved, then you know that, again, it was a perception subjectively perceived that's going to affect the lungs. So if it's the bronchioles, then it's territorial. And if it's the alveoli, then we know it's a death rate. So if there's a nuance with the lungs, it, it can't, if we can't just say, okay, it's the lungs, well, which part of the lungs we need to know because there are two oh, different Lord. tissue groups. Okay. And so, oh, speaking of the lungs, I know somebody who has a diagnosis as a lung tumor, but yet it's not, I don't think it's, if I remember correctly, it's not in the in inside the lung it's on the outside wall outside walls yeah that's, hmm. that's, that's interesting is that affecting their breathing at all no so this would be more like pleura maybe so it's like the the protective layer that covers our organs 
So it would it would have to do with uh, an attack, like a safety. It's a protective mechanism. So did they feel attacked? Did they feel um, like was it a verbal abuse or a, a literal abuse? Um, was it, did they feel soiled or dirty? But mostly it has to do with an attack. Okay. Figurative or literal. Right. Okay. Okay. So say people are, say all of a sudden, you know, something's going around and all these people get it all at the same time. How mm -hmm. people always wonder, well, my whole family came down with this. The whole class came down with this. Usually it's not the mm -hmm. whole, but most of them, right? It's the whole, like everybody's getting this right now. So how was that explained in small situations where everybody seems to be coming up the same kind of symptoms? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a collective conflict shock. So people right. are collectively experiencing um, and perceiving a, a conflict shock at the same time. So in a group, so just imagine, like, I'm not sure, I don't think I shared this example for our first one, but I have a perfect example of this, of my daughter's um, high school. So both my daughters were in high school a couple of years ago. And um, there was a double homicide that happened while they were in school, just, wow. just not far from the high school. They didn't know, no one knew what was going on, but all of a sudden at the end of the day, the it wasn't quite the end of the day for school. And all of a sudden, all these emergency vehicles swarmed the high school, kind of blockaded, right? And they came in and they were like, no one leaves, no one leaves the buildings. I want you guys to lock everything down. And so the principal comes on the intercom and, and is like, wow. okay, no one's leaving. Everyone just stay put. And as soon as we know what's happening, we'll let you know, but do not go anywhere. Don't go out of the parking lot. And, and so imagine a group of people can right. you can you can you see what's happening here? So it's unexpected. It's highly acute, cute, dramatic. It's isolative in an area, and everybody is dealing with this at the same time. Right. So eventually, um, they get things handled, and they allow the students to leave. The teachers leave, and it's a it's a Friday when this happened, and so now they have the weekend. They've resolved the conflict. They, you know, they had plans. The, the kids, they're high schoolers. So they have plans. They're going to their parties. And so they're not thinking about this conflict. It gets resolved. Now come Monday, no one's at school. Like a huge percentage of the population or of the of the faculty isn't there. So even the teachers. Uh -huh. And um, they're like, oh, we had an epidemic. Like, or I mean, we had a breakout, COVID. It just, you know, it's rampant. It ran through the school. Right. And so what seems so, you know, if you don't have this lens of lens on, you see, you'd be like, yeah, that's totally legit. But we know now we, we didn't that, you know, we're not considering the psychological, the emotional, the conflict itself, the shock itself involved. So right. that's an example of how, a, you know, a group of people can come into healing at the same time because they dealt with something at the same time. Um, and that's a, it's a good example because you can see the time frame of how, you know, it was a Friday, it happened and everyone, everyone had plans for the weekend. And so they went about their lives. And so of course they're not conflicted anymore, right? They resolved it. Mm -hmm. And so then that, that explains why everyone moves into the healing phase at the same time over the weekend, they're all sick and no one's coming to school Monday. Right. Um, and so you, uh, you mentioned about in the household, how some people will get it, or maybe three people out of five will get sick. Well, why not all five? Right. Why not all five, right? If it's literal, if it's contagion, it would affect everybody if we're thinking of laws, right? Things that are very the same and can be repeated. But if not everybody subjectively perceives the same type of conflicts, you know, everyone's different in the household. So maybe mom and her daughters perceive things very, very similar and they're very close and their energy is tight. They would perceive things very similar and probably, um, you know, they'll probably end up perceiving it in the exact same way. So, you know, name a situation, anything comes up and it catches the family off guard. How about, let's say um, the snow melted and they had this big ski trip planned and, or maybe the roads were shut down because the, the road conditions are horrible and they can't go to their ski trip. Just literally just name anything. And the daughters and mom are so upset. They, they can't even accept what happened. They were so excited. 
the mom took off work, the daughters had their friends coming and the dad and the boy maybe were like, we'll go next week, like not a big deal. So you can see how, you know, they, it didn't bother them. They didn't subjectively perceive a conflict shock yet the other did, the others did. So it's just, you know, collective conflict shocks are, are, is the answer, the short answer to that with, with those examples. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. It does totally. I'm wondering though, say if somebody, because one, the, the first, like the the idea with the bio, the laws is that there's a, an unexpected conflict shock. Yes. But what if somebody is like, I just find that sometimes people are in a very stressful situation, but it's not unexpected, and it's over the long term. They're living a really stressful life and they have a very there is a strong perception one way or another around it but they're in it but it's not unexpected I feel like that should also over time be affected like they're going to the job they hate it they feel trapped in their or something like that you know and it's mm -hmm. not unexpected they know they're going to go to work every day but they're living this nightmare every day and they don't know how to see how to get out of it can that not somehow affect that does that ever come up at all yeah, well, it, it definitely is going to affect their energy over time. They're going to, their body will eventually, like, they're going to lose energy. They're going to lose weight because being a sympathetic state, a uh, fight or flight state all the time, yeah. your heart is racing, your blood vessels are dilated, you don't have an appetite, you're not sleeping, you're mentally drained, right? You're stressed out. This isn't necessarily a biological conflict. This is a psychological state of mind. This is, right. you know, you're, you're not you're unhappy, you're stressed out. And yeah. so this will affect someone over time. But this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be uh, making tissue adaptations in different organs of the body. In order for that a biological program to initiate, you have to have three criteria, which you yeah. know, it has to be unexpected. So it has to catch you off guard. Like mm -hmm. the definition of a shock is unexpected, right? So that is part of the criteria. It's got to be highly acute, dramatic, and isolated felt. So when those three criteria are met, then that's when you've got a biological program running where tissue adaptation is going to happen or functional loss is going to happen. But when it's just day in and day out stress, you're just living sympathetic, like in the sympathetic phase more often than you're in a vagatonic stage. And, and that is going to definitely wear a person down over time. Right. Right. Um, oh shoot. You just said something that triggers something. I totally forgot what I was going to say. Ah. Okay. Maybe it'll come back to me. Okay. So in your household, when somebody gets, you know, sore lungs, the sniffles, a sore throat, diarrhea, nausea, whatever, mm -hmm. are you doing anything to support that? through supplementation, herbs, anything like that? Or are you purely coming from the GNM perspective and finding out the biological reason? Are you going to try mm -hmm. to support them? Or because I mean they can be really effective. It seemingly, mm -hmm. but again, like you said, you can never separate out that psyche brain organ connection. But I tell you, sometimes it can be pretty miraculous pretty quickly if you get to something right away because somebody doesn't want to experience some longer term symptoms. So what is it that you do in that situation in your house? Yeah, well, it depends, Sasha, you know, how severe our symptoms are. If our symptoms are like bad and we've got like a couple days of diarrhea, you know, we, we're we going to see if we can get some, some supplements or some sort of remedy to cope, like just make the symptoms more manageable. But we, we never take any sort of antibiotics or anything like right. that. Yeah. We, we don't want to yeah. interrupt the healing phase. We want to support um, the odd time, like if I have a headache, for example, I will have caffeine just to help minimize that intensity of the, and I, we always have ice packs in the freezer. So we definitely support our bodies and we, we treat the symptoms as needed to help us cope. But the, the cool thing is, is, um, over the last several years, the, the immediate response is, what are you healing from? Like we get into a conversation about it because yeah. it just, okay. it just, makes everything so much more less scary right yeah and and when you're coming from that point of view all the time it's it helps just completely downgrade the symptoms right. because you you make the correlations right away but 
I would never say not treat the symptoms if it helps you cope with it. Like if you've got intense symptoms and you were sick for a week, or I mean, you were conflict active phase for a week, you can expect a week's time of, you know, some symptoms. So, right. Right. you know, let's, that. let's support the body. Let's, you know, start making some bone broth and, and get you full of really good nutrients to help support the energy. Right. You're not going to be the, the bone broth isn't going to be helping the microbes do their job. Those don't need help, but you're going to be supporting your body. So it's giving it more energy so that your body is just performing like it's more efficient. Right. 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 Do but, you, would you decide to take some extra ferments to increase the microbial diversity in the body? Would you do like, and I, I certainly don't want to ever suppress. I never give anything to suppress. Although homeopathy, if you use homeopathy, that could be freaking magic sometimes, but it's trying to, you know, align these things. Cause there's such amazing tools that can mm -hmm. be really helpful in the moment, you know? So yeah, yeah, you're right. There, there absolutely is. The thing I typically try to do is if it's a stimulant, you, you generally don't want to, like if it's echinacea, you don't want to be taking it during a, a healing phase. Okay. Like let's, let's just really look at, I don't know homeopathics that much. I mean, I, I have homeopathics in my um, cabinet. They're typically um, for headaches. I, I have quite a few headaches because I, I have, I'm hanging healing on tracks, but um this, as long as they're not stimulating and interrupting the healing phase, it's good. We're just, we want to basically just support the body while it's going through the symptoms. Um, and we drink raw milk. So I know we're always getting the microbes. Um, so I don't really go out of my way, Sasha, to, you know, to fill up on, on supplements and stuff, just because it's, I feel like when you, when you try to live biologically, um, you're, you're supported. There's nothing really else you need. Right. Um, right. yeah, there are times though, when like, let's say you're running a lung program and you can't breathe, like it's so hard for you to right. breathe because right. you know, you're in the healing phase. There's, there's the water there. This can be dangerous and you might need a little bit of break from those symptoms. So this is where, you know, you're going to use your discretion. Do I want to interrupt the healing phase? And if you're like, hell yeah, I want to, I need a break, then just do it. Like take right. the, you know, do what you have to do to um, make the symptoms manageable and copable. So now if you say you interrupted in that situation, mm -hmm. would it just after that wore off, would that continue on? Or do you put it kind of paused it and then it's going to have to resolve at some other time? No, it'll continue because as long as the healing phase, like as long as you resolve the conflict, the conflict's resolved. So it will just continue healing. So it's interrupted for a moment. The microbacteria activity is stopped. And, and when you've, uh, when that wears off, the medication wears off or whatever you've taken, then it just picks up from where it goes from where it left off. Right. So it has to complete, you have to complete the process. You're going to have to go through it, but you know, you're, you're just kind of interrupting it because you need it. You need to have that break. Or like, for example, another one that's very common for women is UTIs, right? UTIs can be so, so um, uncomfortable. But the last thing, I, like, but I, I talked to so many women, they are on that, that treadmill. It's like UTI antibiotics, UTI antibiotics. And then they're destroying that microbial population to help with healing, right? In the UTI. And so that's the tell women, boo, if you can, that's why I like, for example, recommending because it's super effective just because most women, 99.9% .9 of them are not going to be willing to go through it until it's resolved on its own. Right. Mm -hmm. So having some cranberry pills, for example, and just mm -hmm. mega dosing on those for a little while to help. Like, I feel like that can really help mm -hmm. resolve it, but it's like, it never gets really worse again, if you get it. So is it like, so my, my confusion is, is so say, for example, I don't get them anymore, but every once in a while I would get a tweak. Like I would get like something because I, 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 I don't know. So this is how I associate with probably totally wrong because of course there's a psyche component to it. But say, for example, I, I need to stay hydrated. That is like mm -hmm. one thing for me is minerals and water. That's one thing that I've always got, right? I've got this going on. I've got trace minerals and some good salt in there and I'm always drinking my water and I just really feel good that way. 
And if for some reason I'm not, then I might get a tweak and it's like, oh, could be something going on. And I don't want to feel that because it's been, I don't want to feel it. So I'll just down a whole bunch of cranberry. But if that was a symptom, then that means that there was something healing, but it never comes back. Right. So it's gone. Like, so did it heal? Like, do you know what I mean? So that's yeah. really confused. Yeah. So, so what happens in that situation? Well, if it was, if it was just a little tweak, as you, as you called it, and just, you know, didn't last very long. If there was a symptom, there would have had to been a biological conflict, right? There would have to yeah. be because yeah. symptoms don't come up unless we're poisoned or we're injured, right? Or malnu malnourished. And right. you're certainly not malnourished, right? So we we have to consider, well, we don't have to consider. We It has to be a conflict. So you would have had a conflict. You might not have known you were conflict active. You right. had the, the symptom come up and you know, helping you. So that was already resolved, but then you take in your, the cranberry yeah. supplements. This also helps on the level of the psyche because you have faith in that, right? It's yes. where are we resolving um, all of our worries on the psychological level? Cause that's where it all starts. So right. if you feel good about what you're doing, it works. Your the timing of the symptoms you, you happen to be in a healing phase. And if it, if there's no more symptoms after that, it's resolved. Like there's nothing more to heal. It was already completed that healing phase. Yeah. Okay. With a healing phase, re, it's quite proportionate to the duration and intensity of the conflict active. Right. So if a person didn't really even realize they were conflict active, you know, that your symptoms might be so minute that you don't even really or you might feel it a little bit, but then it's done just like that. And you attribute to maybe supplements, but you didn't already realize that it was such a small healing phase that it was already done before you, before you really had a chance to think anything else about it. Right, right, right. So my son just recently, and he's just at the end of it, went through this crazy cough thing that he had, but he had this like where he was just sucking wind at the af after it. it just sounded crazy. And so I'm like, this is awesome. Your body's not making mistakes. And then he got really sick of me saying things like that. <laughs> it wasn't actually helping him. So I'm trying to, Tim and I, my husband and I were trying to figure out what kind of, what kind of thing did he just resolve? But it went on for, you know, he got so sick of it for like two and a half, three weeks, maybe. And it's wow. just, I, I just, I, and I don't know. I don't know what it was. And I said, I'm trying to, say in a way that he'll just hear, but he was just so sick of the symptoms. He was just so mm -hmm. sick of feeling that way. And I really didn't know how to help him embrace it. Uh, yeah. and, it's and tough. If symptoms are tough to embrace, especially when you're just starting to learn this stuff. It's like, what the hell? It just seems so, it seems so off because there's so much conditioning. So it's hard to right. embrace the symptoms, but right. I know, I know where you're coming from because I, I deal with that too, especially with my husband, you know, my, <laughs> my girls are on board completely. Like they totally get this. They, yeah. they think biologically, but nice. my husband is still, even though we talk about it so much, it's still, I don't know what, for whatever reason, he has a hard time really getting it. Yeah. So it, and it's fine. It's fine. But just to help him make those correlations, it can yeah. be tough. Yeah. But in a lot of cases, like if you know, it's annoying people to be like, okay, let's just try to figure this out. Just who cares? The conflict's resolved. And the fact that it's kind of ongoing, it might mean that he kind of went in and out of conflict activity, like it may have been hanging healing for a bit. But if he's if it's done now, it's done. You know that there was something in there with territory, some anger yes, going on. It was so, territory. It was. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, we had some interesting talks before that. I'm wondering if that could be perceived as a territory thing. And so that's what we were thinking. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everybody is so subjective. Like, literally, what we would, what we, it wouldn't even flinch us to have a conversation like that. But for like a teenage boy, can you imagine? It could be totally conflicted. I and know. And it's so crazy. On the wrong foot. Well, exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing. And so, and he's like a typical boy. He doesn't voluntarily share a lot of information. And sometimes they'll say or do something. And I'm just like, what? It's like, why would you, what, why would you do that? Like, just, I'm just like, please just explain it to me so I can, so then I can understand. And then I can be like, it's very helpful in this relationship. And sometimes he just like, he thinks he doesn't want to sit. And sometimes he'll share and it'll be something that I, it makes total sense, but would have never occurred to me in a million years. 
Mm -hmm. So, right. So that's the thing. You don't know how they're perceiving stuff going in your life because they see yeah. the world totally differently yes. than you do. So it's just such a, it's just so sometimes so mind boggling. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, I guess I, I guess I can see that. That makes sense. Thank you. Like I'm, I'm so thankful when I get those little tasty morsels of information, right? Because it's just so helpful. Like I, you know, it's different probably than having daughters who not always, but are often more forthcoming with sharing yeah. and information. And so, yeah, it's just, I just love those little opportunities to learn the insights that's going on in a teenage boy's brain <laughs> or even a younger boy's brain. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, that would be helpful. Yeah, totally, totally. Okay, so what I think, I think to the main, I don't know, I think it's kind of basic. Did we miss something? Did we... Is there something that people are often dealing with that, you know, was perceived as something in the public that you want to clear up or, or is it kind of seems like it's, you know, it's always the same kind of answer really, truly. But yeah. I think sometimes when people get, people get also confused. Like I was talking to a woman who's, we talked to GMN a few months ago. Now she's completely hooked. I think she might also connect with you, but she found somebody locally here in the city as well. Um, but sometimes it's hard to decide whether you're really, are you in a hanging something or are you actually healing and being done with it? Like sometimes it's hard to tell what is the actual symptom and what is, why, what's this nagging pain? Like, is the nagging pain a symptom or not? Is it, is that something that's mm. hanging? Okay. Well, a lot of times if say, are you, for example, like, are you thinking like a muscle pain or like a joint pain? What's is yeah, there maybe, something specific? Yeah, maybe here? joint pain. So say uh, a friend of mine is going through some shoulder stuff right now and it's been okay. going on a long time. So yeah, and it's been yeah. taking a long time. So yeah, like, let's go with that. Okay. Yeah. If it's, if it's ongoing, we know there's definitely tracks involved because, you know, the it's hang and healing is common. Uh, you know, we have so many unresolved conflicts. And um, tracks are one of those things. I think we talked about tracks during the first. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, didn't we? Right. It's it's the thing in within your environment. The moment that you subjectively perceive a conflict shock, your psyche or your subconscious records pretty much everything in your environment and kind of takes a snapshot imprint of all of the things that it perceives as significant. That would it'll establish it as a warning signal in your mind. So that next time you come near that type of, maybe it's a person or maybe it's a smell or maybe it's the temperature outside, but next time it's you're around that, it's gonna be like, oh wait, remember last time you were here, this is what happened to you. And so it's protective mechanism to help warn you to stay clear so that you won't um, experience another conflict shock. So those are called tracks. That's what Dr. Hammer called these. And so a lot of times this is what makes our, our symptoms ongoing is, is we have this buildup of tracks. Um, typically it's more than one track. Like if, if it's a long extended period of time, there's, there's multiple tracks. And so we have to, I think the easiest way, the way that I do and the way that I tell pretty much all of my, you know, my clients is start a journal, a symptom journal and, or just a log, like it doesn't have to be anything fancy, literally writing down the date, writing down your environment to like to the weather, to who you were around, to the conversations and just trying to get as specific as you can so that over time, like a week of entering th this information, you can clearly highlight all the common denominators in there. And it kind of really, you know, reveals your tracks to you. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, that's the way that we, we need to be able to resolve our finally come into resolution. Right. Um, and oftentimes if we can't find our tracks, well, then let's, let's figure out, like if it's a shoulder pain, shoulder always has to do with relationships. So depending on the, the shoulder, if it's right or left side, do you know if they're right or left-handed? Right. They're right-handed. Right. And what yeah. shoulder is it? Well, it's kind of both, but right now the worst one is the right. Okay. So this is anyone other than his or her mother or child. So it's a partner. So it's often self-devaluation, bones, ligaments, joints, tendons, mm -hmm. lymph nodes, all this is self-devaluation. So what can't I, you know, I can't do something. I'm unable to do something um, and something good, right? So relationships, who am I being a bad partner to? Who am I not measuring up to as a partner? 
who can't I support like I want to? But it has that nuance, that theme around it. And if it's ongoing, and let's say, you know, it has to do with the family home or something, or a child or um, a work related, if they're in that environment all the time, that they may not ever be able to um, eliminate those tracks. But if you were able to perceive the situation differently, knowing that, you know, you're, you're doing the best that you can, it's all about how we perceive this, the perception that we have about ourselves. Once that shifts, the conflict becomes irrelevant and all the tracks become irrelevant at that point and it goes into resolution once and for all. It's, it has to, you know, a conflict is perceived at the level of the psyche. That's the first point. So it has to resolve at the level of the psyche. Right. And that requires a perception shift about who you are as a partner, who you're being. You, there has to be some sort of resolution that you come to terms with around your role in that relationship. And, and once that person fully like, you know, feels better about their role in the relationship, and comes to terms with it, um, it'll resolve. And that ongoing issue won't become, it, it won't be ongoing anymore. So will that look like more intense pain for a little while, like making it yeah. look like a lot worse for a little period of time? And then, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And to recognize maybe there's times where it's like, okay, this is really, really intense. Well, that's a good point to, to recognize. Okay. I'm definitely yes. in a healing phase now. Right what can I do to support it? You know, what can I do to support myself? And also try to make the emotional correlation. Right. So, you know, I, there obviously is a relief at the level of the subconscious. So what was it? Like, how do you feel? Like maybe just journal about it. Just right. try to really self-inquiry inquiry is needed for this type of mm -hmm. work. It really is because it all, it's all about the psyche and, and those conflicts. Is there a maximum time where that healing phase should be over in? Like, I know it can be very, very quick, but something that's been going on, like, can it be months and months? Like say, okay, say for example, somebody's hips are extremely deteriorated. From GNM, is that something that you would, like, that could be a really painful process to regenerate yeah. all that material. Is that something that would happen? Is that how long would that take? Well, it could happen. It would take a long time, but at that point, like it might, it might need, you might need to get surgery at that point. Yeah. There's times where you do need to yeah. have the surgery. It's yeah. just gone on too far. Right. Um, there's lots of times where that, that has to happen. So right. it's just, you know, that's why being aware of, of what you're going through and the conflicts in your life, you know, let's, let's try to just, let's try to, um, you know, just make a small shift in perception. Like, it, is it as bad as we think it is? Like, is our life truly at stake? Is, is uh, you know, how bad do we really have it? Or can we just maybe switch the perspective a little bit and and realize there's actually really good here? And, and you're, you know, you're empowered. You're empowered to choose anything you want. So right. if you're not liking the situation, if you're not liking anything, you, you get to choose something different. Right. And it's uncomfortable, I know. I, I get it. I know it's uncomfortable, but we're our own, you know, it's our responsibility. Our health is, is all dependent on our, our own choices and, and our conflicts. Right. So um, yeah, it's, it's an inner journey and it's our own journey, yeah. but it's always wonderful to have people there to support you and, and be in a tribe and a community that thinks like you, because it, it just makes the fear less intense. Right, right. And okay, one more question. And I think we're done for today because we got to save some for future stuff. So what I am wondering, why would in some people a death fright look like maybe asthma and one would look like cancer? What what's the situ what what creates the tumor and what creates, you know, some other problem in that same tissue? Because well, not always cancer, right? Sorry. Right. Yep, that's a that's a good question. If I've understood stood your question right, um, a death fright would only affect the lung alveoli, so it would only be a tumor. That would be the result of a conflict active. Okay, a tumor of a death only fright. A tumor. It can't be just okay. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so it it depends on the brain relay and the tissue group. 
So the conflict, the type of conflict and how that person associated it in that moment, right? That subjective perception, that determines where in the brain the impact is. And that impact determines which organs and tissue groups is yes. affected. Yeah. So in the, in the endodermal tissues, it's tumors all the time. That is the, the biological adaptation oh, okay. to any endodermal tissue group. Oh, okay. But in a, a mesodermal group or an ectodermal group, it's actual tissue ulceration. So you have a loss of tissue. So there won't be a tumor growth in those types of conflicts because it's a different biological adaptation. So if, somebody can have a tumor outside, like it's not inside. They could have a tumor growing outside their body, can't they? Like yeah, a growth outside the body. Yeah, and so that it, depending on where it, that's usually um, the uh, cerebral that's that belongs to the cerebral group. So we're talking mesodermal tissue, mm -hmm. um, and so that that's a different. It's a different tissue, but it's a different. Uh, it wouldn't be the um, epi, sorry, the epidermis, it'd be the corium. So that's the under layer. But yes, tumors can happen when it's hang and healing, hang and heal, and it's just growth, growth, tissue breakdown, growth, tissue breakdown, or vice versa, tissue breakdown and restoration, tissue breakdown and restoration. And, and then it just becomes this, this growth. It's just from continuous conflict relapses over and over. It's mm -hmm. never resolved. And so it never gets fully breaking down. Mm, okay. Because I just think ulceration, if it's going to be on the outer levels, ulceration doesn't sound like a tumor to me. It sounds like loss, right? It sounds... Yeah. Ulceration is yeah. tissue loss. Yeah. And then there's buildup again in the healing phase for restoration. So tissue growth again. Right. Um, but just, you know, that's, that's that biological program. Yeah. Um, underneath the skin in the corium, so that the layer underneath the epidermis, yeah. That would be more of the attack where you will get growth buildup over time. So you got the ulceration, you got the buildup, you get the ulceration and it's just ongoing. This is, that's the result of it. Right. Okay. Okay, madam. Well, let's thank you for all of that. This is so great guys. I just hope this is one of my goals is to help people remove that fear of contagion. Don't worry if somebody has a cold sore. And you're going to share your kids drink with them. Don't worry if somebody coughs over there and you're in the same room with them. Like it's not, you know, we're, we're so germaphobic. We're so worried about cleaning the doorknobs and doing all this stuff. And it's like, don't let that own you. Don't let that own you. That's not fair. It's not, we live in a world, we can't live in a sterile world. And the more sterile it becomes, the worse we're off, right? Like it's, we're not better off by sterilizing everything. We're worse off. So so thank you for that, Tanya. That's really super amazing information. I love all of it. Can you share with us again so people know how to reach you? What do you do with people? How can they get involved with you? Sure. Thanks, Sasha. Yes, I do do personal like one-on-one -on -one consults, German New Medicine consults. So people can reach out to me at tanyaverkwin.ca. And I also have a membership. It's New Perspectives membership where we're meeting twice every, every month and yeah, we're talking GNM the whole time. So we're doing case studies and our personal stories and just questions like this. Like it's basically like this, this format we're on Zoom and we're all sharing, we're all learning together and it's fantastic. So that's that's a wonderful group. There's the ladies, it's, there's, we've got one man in there and actually have a big brother. Now. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we it's such a wonderful supportive group of ladies. We're, yeah, it's amazing. So the actual registration is opening up again for that at the end of February. So ah, if you're interested okay. in that, there's also a link for that um, at tanyaverkwin.ca as well. And I'm on Instagram at Pixelated Perspectives Podcast too. Right. And so she also has her own podcast guide called Pixelated Perspectives. So you can listen to that. Lots of interesting information there. And how long will your registration stay open for? It's always open for a week. So I open it up a few yeah, times each year. It. Um, and, you know, if you happen to miss it, you, I've had people come in after like when it's closed, that's fine. It's just I like to have everyone at the same level. So we kind of go yeah. through the basics again and then we're all starting from the same. But right now we've we've all gained enough. We've covered enough where we're actually getting into constellations. So the more advanced stuff, but it's it's lots of fun. You can that's why I, I try to open it up at certain times so we can kind of get everybody on the same page again. And then we we just learn together. We just keep going. 
Awesome. Awesome. Great opportunity, guys. Great, great, great. Or one-on-one. -on -one. I know some people that have uh, had consults with you and they are extremely happy and they think they, they really appreciate the way you explain it and go through it. I think you're very clear. So mm -hmm. it really just Amazing. simplifies, you know, not everybody can, can relay the information that way. So that's great. Oh, I'm so, that's great feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sasha. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've been, been, it's been awesome to meet some of your community as well. Mm -hmm. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys. Well, I know you think this is great, right? So please share, check out my shop on the sovereign collective.org. I do have some things that you can get there. Uh, please share. I never ask people to, to rate this podcast, but Hey, if you love this podcast, rate this podcast, help me spread it out. I really want to grow this podcast this year. It's been really hard. I've been shadow banned very early on. So it's really hard to grow when, you know, people can't find you. So spread the word, help me grow this. Cause I know it's, it's helping people. And I, I love, love, love getting your feedback as well. So if you can share feedback, that'd be great. And until next time, be well and have fun learning how to own your health.